that I think most of the people in the room may not know except for one David Ewing, um, who will enlighten us, I'm sure. I'm Sherry Weiner. I am the chair of the committee. And I'd like to thank my vice chair, Courtney Johnston, for being here and participating in the forum today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge those council members that are here, council member John Rutherford, council member Jason Spain, council member Clay Cap, and have I missed anybody? Former council member Dave Rosenberg, we're happy to have him, and um, so thankful that these folks agreed to participate with us today and um, share their knowledge and their understanding of our history with us so that we can have a little better understanding as we move into the deliberations for what, if any, charter amendments we might put forth this year. And, and so I just want to thank you and let you know that the reason we picked today in particular is today is the anniversary of the swearing in of the first mayor and um, council of the new consolidated government. So without any further ado, um, we're going to hear from all of these folks and moderated by our friend David Ewing. And I'd like to call on Courtney Johnston to tell you a little bit about our speakers. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, Nashville native David Ewing, a possible descendant of Andrew Jackson. He is a ninth generation Nashville resident and direct descendant of Prince Albert Ewing, the first African American to practice law in Tennessee and a six time judge. Ewing attended Peabody Demonstration School from nursery school to 12th grade. He received his bachelor's degree from Connecticut College and earned uh, a law degree from uh, Vanderbilt University Law School. David was on the Nashville Chamber's executive team, supporting the development of a comprehensive regional transportation infrastructure, celebrating cultural diversity, assuring a vital downtown, and providing advocacy within the government. He served on the board of over 20 different civic organizations and businesses, including Capital Bank and Trust, Summit Medical Center, Cheekwood Museum of Art, the Nashville Opera, and Middle Tennessee Boys and Girls Club. Welcome, David. Mrs. Wynn joined the staff in September 1974 after earning a bachelor's and master's degree in history and a master's in public administration from Tennessee State University. She serves as a legislative liaison and oversees administrative, budgetary, and state pragmatic, um, pro programmatic, I'm sorry, functions at THC. Wynn co-founded the Nashville Conference on African American History and Culture and is an author and frequent speaker on Tennessee history. She is editor of Journey to Our Past, a guide to African American markers in Tennessee, and co-edited profi Profiles of American African Americans in Tennessee, I'm sorry, as well as Freedom, Facts, and Firsts, 400 Years of the African American Civil Rights Experience. Wynn authored African Americans in Tennessee for the African American State by State Encyclopedia and her chapter Beyond Patriarchy, the meaning, meaning of Martin Luther King Jr. for the women of the world appears in Caught in an Inescapable Network of Mutuality. The Frist Museum's award-winning We Shall Overcome catalog includes her chapter Nashville, an Inspirational City. Wynn has served as a consultant to the State Museum and to the Nashville Public Library Foundation for its Votes for Women project. She is a member of the Nashville City Cemetery Board, the Nashville Public Television Advisory Board, and the Metropolitan Historical Commission of Nashville and Davidson County. Welcome, Ms. Wynn. Former Deputy Mayor Brenda Haywood was highlighted in a photographic exhibition in recognition of her groundbreaking achievement in furthering the public school desegregation of the city on the second floor of the Nashville Public Library in downtown Nashville. Moments from the movement told the story of Nashville's public school desegregation in the 1960s with a particular focus on 12-year-old Brenda Harris, who along with three other girls, Pamela Franklin, Beverly Ward, and Bernadine, Rabeth Alley, did I say that right? Integrated the seventh grade in East Nashville's Stratford High School in 1963, the same year that Metro government consolidated. Brenda graduated in 1969 and continued her education at Tennessee State University. She was a teacher and administrator in a career spanning nearly 40 years in Metro schools. She became an ordained minister in 2008 and was elected to the Metro Council in District 3 in 2015. She held that post until 2019 when Mayor Cooper appointed her Deputy Mayor of Community Engagement. Welcome, Ms. Brenda. 
Charter Revision Commission Chair Dewey Brandstetter comes to the commission naturally, his father having served on as one of the original authors of the Metro Charter. Mr. Brandstetter was an elected member of the Metropolitan Board of Public Education for 11 years, acting as chairman for three. He served on the boards of the Community Foundation of Middle Tennessee, the Center for Nonprofit Management, and the Nashville Alliance for Public Education. His legal work focuses on municipal and utility issues, employment, and complex litigation. He is currently chairman of the Metropolitan Charter Revision Commission, having served on the commission since 2006. Welcome. Jim Murphy has represented both governmental entities and private sector clients in numerous economic incentives transactions. Jim practiced for 18 years in Metro Legal, serving as the Director of Law from 1993 to 1999. In his highly visible role with the city, Jim provided legal advice to the mayor and Metro Council, along with other municipal departments, boards, and commissions. He counseled the mayor and the Metro Council regarding the economic development incentives for Opryland, Columbia HCA, Thomas Nelson, and Dell Computer Corporation. Jim's legal acumen was also, also instrumental in the establishment of the Sports Authority and the Hospital Authority in Nashville, the development of the downtown arena and the football stadium, and the leases with the Tennessee Titans and the Nashville Predators. In addition to assisting clients on economic incentives, Jim handles complex matters involving zoning, condemnation, elections, telecommunications, municipal law, environmental law, and commercial real estate. He has served on the Charter Revision Commission since 2018. Welcome, all of you. And before I turn the program over to Mr. Ewing, I want to call your attention to our vice mayor who is going to be participating and sharing with us information about the charter revision before us. And um, f we're fortunate to have her here um, as my predecessor as Charter Revision Committee Chair, and in which time she did a lot of work insofar as bringing the history of the Charter Revisions to date, which is available on SharePoint, um, available for the community and the council members. And so with no further ado, we thank you for being with us and greatly appreciative of everyone here. And I'm gonna turn the floor over to Mr. Ewing. Thank you, Sherry, and thank you, members of this group that are willing to serve and talk to us about the great document. Um, as Sherry said, this is the 61st anniversary of metropolitan government right across the street uh, on April Fool's Day. Um, Forty members of the uh, Metro Council, the newly formed Metro Council, were sworn in along with, with uh, Mayor Beverly Briley, first mayor of Metropolitan Government Nashville and Vice Mayor George Kate. And this is a day that we should all kind of recognize and celebrate and we had a big anniversary for 60 and 50 right here in this building and Rosie was part of that big organization. So thank you Rosie for hosting us here today at this wonderful courthouse. Uh, before we had Metropolitan Government, we did have cooperation and this courthouse is a perfect example of that. If you look on the outside of this building, it says Davidson County Courthouse and Public Building. And underneath it, it says City Hall. So this was part of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal program. And they built this as kind of a cooperation between um, county government and city government. The health department was originally in this building and actually their name was on the west side of the building. Um, and this was a place where not only the mayors was here, the um, city council was here, and then of course the courthouse and the county court. So let's talk about kind of briefly how Nashville came to be. As a city, um, we were founded by some settlers here on Christmas Day, 1779. They stopped at a bend in the Cumberland River, including James Robertson and John Donaldson. Um, there's a fort, a uh, reproduction fort, our very own Williamsburg here right on the river. But the original fort was in between uh, 3rd and 4th Avenue on Church Street because there was a natural spring there. And basically the city kind of evolved around that fort. Uh, the original name of Nashville was Nashboro. But if anyone who's seen the great play Hamilton, we did not like the British. Borough was a British name. We changed it to Ville. Uh, the first clerk of the city, Andrew Ewing, a distant cousin, uh, kept on writing Nashville. And so we became Nashville. Um, we eventually built a courthouse in this vicinity and uh, Second Avenue and the First Avenue was where everything started. 
So how did we get from county to city and all of this? Well, of course, the city grew. Andrew Jackson, of course, who was our first congressman in 1796. Um, actually, Nashville was an older, is older than the state of Tennessee. Nashville was founded in 1779. The state was started um, June 1st, 1796, when George Washington signed the papers, making us the 16th state to join the Union and the last under our first president. Um, Andrew Jackson lived in the county, kind of in the outer reaches, and of course commuted here uh, to practice law. But um, any, now Jim, you're a Vanderbilt graduate, aren't you? Who's? No, sir. No, UT, University UT, no, that's right, I'm teasing you. He's been on the board of UT before. But we don't have any, do we? You're no, the van. Do you? a double door. You're a double door. <laughs> So, um, not to embarrass you, Dewey, but what's the first line of Vanderbilt's alma mater? Reared on the western sky. On the city's western border. border. Okay. So when Vanderbilt was started in... I didn't realize it was going to be a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> when, Van when Vanderbilt was started in 1873, it was not in the city of Nashville. It was on the city's western border. And the city would eventually grow and annex and include the Vanderbilt area. But interestingly enough, um, when we had the World's Fair here in 1897, when we built the Parthenon, we decided that we needed a better governmental structure for that area of town, which was unincorporated. So the founders of the World's Fair, these businessmen, they decided to incorporate that area as Centennial City. And it had a mayor and a city council of five people and it basically to pass laws that you know the county did not have. And that's a current theme that we'll hear later, that the county really didn't have a lot of laws and regulations and the city did. And that's one of the reasons why metropolitan government was important and also services. The same uh, sewage system that they built for the World's Fair in 1897, the city of Nashville still uses that brick sewer and it goes through Centennial Park and Ellington Place. So, um, but let's, I'm gonna, Fast forward to um, 1952. This is a book called Future Nashville. This is what we're good at in Nashville is about planning for the future. And this was done by a group of Nashvillians. And this community-driven report basically decided that consolidation was the way to go. What was happening here, and one of the board members, um, who Linda will speak of, Rebecca Thomas, the, the LMC Tower had just been built. And Rebecca Thomas, who was a lawyer, said, from the observation deck in any direction, you could see residential and industrial developments in suburban areas that don't have city services. They don't have water, they don't have fire and police, and they don't have um, other city services. And for that reason, these people, they saw where Nashville or the region was growing, and it wasn't in the old city limits. And so this was the first report that basically said, we need to change that and combine the city and the county. But how do you do that? It's actually kind of hard. The state has to give you permission to do that. Fortunately for Nashville, the report was done in June of 1952. And it, seek, and it was going to amend Section 8, Article 11, Section 9 of the Tennessee State Constitution. Now, there's only one group that can amend the Constitution, and it's not us. It was the state of Tennessee and the legislature. It just happened that the state had a constitutional convention in 1953, and this passed as part of that. So the um, amendment that passed, the General Assembly may provide for the cons consolidation of any or all of governmental and corporate functions now and here vested in the municipal corporations within the government corporation functions, as long as a majority of the city and the county voted for that. And so that's exactly what happened. The other thing that really happened to kind of put this on a different path was Beverly Briley spoke to the National Rotary Club on June 21st, 1955, about the feasibility of one government. Now, Beverly Briley was the county judge which was basically kind of like the city executive or the mayor of the county, and Ben West was the mayor of Nashville. Um, the very next year, in 1956, there was a plan for metropolitan government report, which basically also 
um, allowed for consolidation based on what the legislature had done. And in 1958, um, we had a vote. We put together a charter commission and others will talk longer about this. And annexation um, was going to, you know, oh, in, in 1958, annexation was starting to happen. In 1958, we annexed almost seven miles of city land, the county land, into the city. They didn't have anything to say about it. We just said, you're part of Nashville. Congratulations. Okay. And then in 1960, we did 42 miles. Ben West did this. And why this is interesting, um, the county didn't have anything to do with it, but they then got a tax bill from us, and it was higher. But they were promised all these great city services, which we said to them, oh, we'll get around to that. So um, 1961, of, and the, the first time, George Cate, I have to mention the, the first vice mayor of Nashville, uh, Angie Henderson is our current vice mayor. George Cate was a great leader and a great person. And he was part of not the original charter group, but he was part of something called um, the Good Government, Citizens for Good Government, which basically was the group to kind of promote this and lobby for this across the county and the city. And George said that originally this original bill did not pass, even though everyone was for it. The new, remember we had two newspapers, the Banner and the Tennessean, and they wouldn't agree on anything, but they agreed on metropolitan government. Ben West agreed on it. Beverly Briley agreed on it. The NAACP agreed on it. Labor unions agreed on it. The chamber agreed on it. And when it went to a vote, it failed the first time. So the second time, Ben West actually decided he was going to be against it. But what happened with Mayor West um, in 19, um, the, Mayor West basically in 1959, after it failed, he wanted to bring in some revenue and really kind of tell the people in the county, you're still going to have to pay to use city services. So he had a $10 wheel tax, which had not been done before in 19, August of 1959. And you had to have a green sticker on your car in the front of your windshield. And people call that 10 for Ben. You would have thought you were asking for $1,000 from people. And this uh, was so hated that basically, even if you lived in the county, and worked in the city, drove your car in the city, or went shopping, you had to have this sticker. And so the public was outraged by this, and there was a huge backlash for this. And so when Ben West, this is what George Cate used to always say, when Ben West was so adamant about this sticker, people thought anything that Ben West is against must be good. So when he changed his mind, and was against metropolitan government after this the controversial wheel tax sticker, people were in the county, because the first time it passed in the city and failed in the county. And the second time, after Ben West kind of got involved, you know, people were like, well, if Ben West is against it, it must be good. And so that, George Cate will tell us that, would tell us that's why it passed. Um, a lot of I used to work at the chamber and George Cate was one of our most popular speakers because he would go to all these other counties across the country, cities that wanted to do metropolitan government, Oklahoma City, St. Louis, and they would just ask him, how did you do it? How did you do it? Because, and we'll ask Dewey and Jim, um, basically, how did we do it? Because this was very unlikely, and today we could have never done this because people are so entrenched. But... George would always say it was just the community coming together, the right minds, people on this charter commission, which Linda will talk about, mm -hmm. and putting this together because most people thought it was for the good of Nashville. And I want to read to you a quote from Z. Alexander Luby. There will be a, there's a lot to, said. Z. Alexander Luby was a city council person and was African-American lawyer here in town, very respected. Uh, was the student of a lot of the lunch counter sit-in um, protesters, including John Lewis and Diane Nash. And Ben West, in 1958, asked him to be on the committee for the Charter Commission. And he told Mayor West at the time, you know, I don't even know my position yet, and I might be against it. And then when Luby, who was a just gifted lawyer, read, got, you know, deep into kind of studying this, he said... 
it will benefit us all, meaning as Nashvillians. And even, and he believed the advantage will be also to the African Americans. And whatever benefits Nashville, Luby thought, also benefits the African American community. And he thought drawing the boundaries of the council districts will include representation. So when L Luby, this committee at the time, and Linda will get into this, had an African American member and a woman member, both lawyers. And I think having diverse voices definitely kind of helped this. So um, the last thing I'll say before I, I'll open it up to um, our other colleagues here on the panel is George would always talk about, he, he would go to Memphis a lot. Memphis, you know, Memphis wanted metropolitan government for a long time. And of course they could not agree on metropolitan government, unfortunately. What ended up happening, you know, Nashville was actually becoming what we, what we call a donut city in the 70s and 80s. You know, the downtown, um, basically everyone was leaving downtown Nashville. Retail left downtown Nashville. Movie theaters left downtown Nashville. Religious organizations left downtown Nashville. And really the only people that were left in downtown were the bankers and the lawyers. And this continued and continued. And, and that's the kind of battle between metro government, county. The, a donut city is basically a city where the suburbs are bo booming and the center is dead and empty. And metropolitan government kind of definitely helped make its city. If we did not have metropolitan government, we would not have an arena downtown, a sports facility. We wouldn't have these new libraries, museums, because everything would have been built in the suburbs. And so one of the greatest things that we've done in the city in the last 70 years is metropolitan government. So George would always say that when he went to Memphis and, and talked to them about metro government, he felt that Met Memphis would never get on board because they just fight all the time. And he, he said, if the 23rd Psalm were on the ballot in Memphis, it would fail two to one. So um, that is kind of our introduction to all this. But we have experts here that can talk about kind of how the charter was drafted, you know, who was on it, and kind of what really made uh, the two different parts, um, one failed and one passed. And we'll turn over to Jim. Uh, and he'll talk about, you know, these two. Why did we have two? Why did we have two tries? And the, the, one of the things I want that's you to Dewey's, kind of, Dewey's two bites at the Consolidation Act bill. Okay. Mine's two communities. Two communities. Yeah. Oh, okay. well, let's just talk about county and city. Yeah. So, so I think that's you've started a lot of that conversation, and I'll I'll uh, echo some of some of the things that you said and and give a little more, and also throw in some legal mumbo jumbo just so that we can also understand some of the limitations on what were, were happening at the time that the charter was being debated and passed you mentioned it before uh you know there was some talk in the in the early 50s about consolidating the cities and counties but there was no way to do that until the 1953 constitutional amendment because uh, cities and counties are different under the law counties are created under the Tennessee Constitution and so they have the status of being in the Constitution where the legislature can't take them away they can't eliminate them because they're in the Constitution they have to be counties uh, there are offices in uh, counties that are meant that are required by the Constitution the assessor the trustee the clerk the county clerk those are constitutional officers and they're required to be in every county so the legislature can't take them away cities on the other hand are total creations of the legislature and the legislature up until 1953 the legislature could create cities at their whim and they could abolish cities at their whim and the history of tennessee cities up until 1953 was anytime the legislature got mad at a city they just abolish it and start over and so all those people that were holding office at the time, they were kicked out and you had to have a new election and elect those people. Well, that is part of, David mentioned the 1953 amendment that added the consolidation of cities and counties, but there also was the Home Rule Amendment, which was passed in 1953 at the same constitutional convention. And, that con and the Home Rule Amendment provided, one, that cities could become 
basically a home rule cities by passing a referendum and when you became a home rule city that meant you could alter your charter without legis without going to the state legislature so you were not required to get your charter approved by the state legislature up until the 1953 constitutional amendment most cities in tennessee and, and it might be all of them i haven't ever tried to go back and look at all that but most all cities were created by private act and what is a private act a private act is a piece of legislation that only applies to a particular county or or portion of the county i.e a city so most charters of cities in tennessee prior to 1953 were created by private act and the private act could be adopted by the legislature and it could be amended by the legislature anytime it wanted anytime the legislature was in session so the Tennessee Municipal League and others went through this home rule initiative to basically limit the power of the legislature to to change city governments. And so the home rule amendment said, one, in the future, all city charters have to be done by general act. You can no longer have a city charter that's created by private act. It has to be by general act. And so they've created two or three different general act city structures that new cities have to be created under the second thing they said was any private act that any act of the legislature that is local in form or effect cannot be affected effective unless it's approved by a two-thirds vote of the legislative body of that local community the city or the county so now if the legislature wanted to adopt a private act they had to do that by I mean, that would apply to a particular city or a particular county. They had to get local approval. And then the third thing they did is they created a mechanism where a city could basically become a home municipality by adopting a referendum. And from that point forward, it could amend its charter by ordinance of the, uh, amend its charter, excuse me, could amend its charter by referendum. But those referendums would basically then say that no more that the legislature could only affect their charter by general act. No more private acts could affect their charter. So they had two or three different things that were blended into that whole concept in order to try to make cities have a little more stable environment. So one thing that changed in the early 50s was the constitution change. David talked about the city and county dis, uh, uh, issues, the donut city concept, and that really was part of what was going on. Uh, Nashville had not amended its boundaries. It had not annexed property between 1929 and 1958. So the boundaries of the city of Nashville had stayed constant for many, many, many years. And so as a result, as all the areas around the city of Nashville, like Green Hills and, you know, uh, Madison and other surrounding areas were being developed, they were all in the county. And so you had all these people moving into Nashville and living in the suburbs and moving out of Nashville into the suburbs. You had businesses that were moving out of the city and into the suburbs. And one of the things that was different, and David mentioned a little bit about it, cities tended to provide more services at that time than counties did because in, to some extent counties ability to provide what were considered municipal services, which were water and sewer and trash collection was more limited back then that was changed in the 60s and 70s counties were given more powers to do that but back in the 50s counties really didn't have power to do their own water and sewer system so the people in the suburbs would move into the suburbs and they didn't have a sewer system they had septic tanks and if you want to know why most of the neighborhoods in Nashville have large lots it's because they needed large lots to have septic tanks and guess what happens I used to be a surveyor when I was in, from the eighth grade until I got out of, got into college, out of college, I guess, in the law school. And we used to have to go out and dig holes in the ground to see if the, the soil would percolate, because if the soil wouldn't percolate, your septic system wouldn't work. Well, a lot of septic systems started failing in the areas around Nashville, and they didn't have a solution. There, were, there wasn't a sewer system to serve them, so that was a problem. There wasn't fire protection in the county. And so people who lived in the county who wanted to have somebody put their house out if it caught on fire had to subscribe to a private fire service. 
they didn't have trash collection, so people had to hire a trash collector. Uh, the police protection was provided by the sheriff. We had to patrol 500 and some miles with a very limited staff, so there was no real effective fire protection, uh, police protection. The water system wasn't very good, so all these things that David talked about were going on. People in the counties were becoming uh, uncomfortable with the fact that they were not getting many services. Uh, the city, on the other hand, felt like that the county people were mooching off the city because they were providing all the roads and sidewalks and parks, and they had to pay for them out of the city taxes, and the people that were living in the county didn't have to pay for any of those things until the green sticker issue came along. And so that was, that was a, a, a big part of the de debate. Again, the population, the city's population was actually declining and the county's population was growing. I think between 1950 census and the 1960 census, the county's population went up 24%, so the city's population declined 2%. So you had a situation just exactly like David described you had a, um, a donut being created with the city seeing its resources kind of going away and the county residents living in the county paying little taxes and getting little services and wanting more services. And so I think it, part of what George Kate um, and George was, he was the guy to talk to about all this. He knew it all. But, and Dewey's, and Dewey's dad, obviously. I mean, if Dewey, Dewey is the son of the Metro Charter because his dad was the father of the Metro Charter. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it, I mean, all these things kind of combined at a time before the desegregation of the schools issue hit. And I think that's one of the factors that really allowed this to pass and one of the reasons why it's not passed in Knoxville, it's not passed in Memphis. It's only really passed, the consolidated governments have only really occurred in small communities where, uh, you know, Hartsville and uh, Moore County, where you had a very small city basically consolidating with a very rural county. You, you don't have the situations like we're president of Nashville. So th those are kind of the, that's kind of set up the two different communities. The, the county was predominantly white at the time. The city was, was still, I think in uh, 60, the city was 38% African American. So it had grown in the, in the time period uh, as a lot of white people moved out so you were seeing changes but it was not as polarized i think as it has become it became over the years and so i think that's in my opinion at least one of the reasons why it was able to pass here and struggles other places so one question one question before we go to dewey what would nashville look like today if we never pass this the, uh, the county and all that go to birmingham Okay, Birm no, it's more Birmingham. I think it's more apt example. In Birmingham, you have a a relatively small city surrounded by a bunch of other cities like Mountain Home and all these other communities. Very I think, affluent. Yes. Yeah, well, mostly affluent. Not all of them, but mostly. But but basically, what would you would have seen? I think would have, you, instead of having six satellite cities, you probably have ten or twelve just ringing, ringing the county bringing the city of Nashville so that those uh, people in those communities could get city level services without having been part of Nashville. That's what, that's my guess as to what might happen. It's always good to try to guess or interesting to try to guess. We never know, but I think it would look a lot different. And I think Birmingham might be the most apt example. And we're not trying to be like Birmingham right now. Um, you know, I have a lot of law partners in Birmingham, <laughs> uh, uh, but I much prefer living in Nashville than Birmingham. Dewey, the son of the city well, I, charter. I, I appreciate that. This is something very near and dear to my heart because of my father's involvement, having served on both charter commissions, uh, 58 and 62. Uh, he then served, I guess, 35 years as the 
chairman of the Charter Revision Commission. He uh, obviously there was a lot of there were a lot of other people who were involved, but uh, but Dad wrote many of the provisions of the Metro Charter, particularly the uh, the parts that relate to employees and employee protections. Um, and served, as I said, for many years on the Charter Revision Commission, and then I was fortunate enough to take his place and have done that done that for a number of years. But um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the two attempts to consolidate. And I'm really glad that both uh, David and Jim talked about the history of Nashville and kind of where it was, because whenever I do this, I always talk about two factors that really led to consolidation. And one was the demographic changes that, that both David and Jim have mentioned and talking about how the city of Nashville was declining and the county of Davidson was growing 24 percent. Interestingly, the black population in Nashville from in 1940 was 28 percent and in 1960 it was over 40 percent. And during the this 50s post-war period prosperity, people who could afford to move were moving out of the city and into the county. And as they were leaving, so did services, so did shopping. People didn't go to Harvey's and Castronaut and Kane Sloan and other places that David would tell you about in the Nashville he wished he knew. Um, and they were going out into the, the suburban areas. Uh, the Green Hills Mall, which was a strip center at the time, opened in 1955. I always love to ask this question, and David, you can't tell the answer because I know you know. What was the first mall in Nashville? Anybody know? I don't know. Hmm? I don't know. No, the first mall, first mall in Nashville was the arcade that opened in 1903. So, <laughs> just kind of an interesting side note. So, demographic changes, and, and the other thing I always mention, and again, that, that David and Jim have both hit on is the ability to provide services. The city, which had sewer system, a water system, its own education system, and, and was and a police department, was able to provide a number of, of services. But as the population moved into the county, uh, the, that tax base left, so the ability to provide those services became greatly diminished. And as, as both David and Jim mentioned, you had people from the county using all the city services, the roads, the parks, the libraries, but they weren't paying for them. So, um, and then in the county, as, as, as they both mentioned, no sewer system. The only fire protection were subscription services, volunteer fire departments. And if you didn't belong to a, a, a volunteer fire department, department, your house caught on fire, just burn down. They would not come to your house because if they ever did that, they would then know nobody would join their subscription service. Um, also, like Jim mentioned about you know, the, the police department, um, in the county in, in the 1950s, 1955, there was one sheriff and 52 um, deputies. Uh, compare that to the 1,500 sworn officers that we now have in, in, the, in the city, uh, in, in the consolidated government. The, the, obviously, the population changed, but the size hasn't changed, so you had a very limited number of, very limited ability to serve, police, fire, those kinds of services. So in the, in the 50s, it's been talked about, people came together and said, we, let's look at how we can have the county provided services um, and protect the city so that it doesn't just dwindle away and become like some of the cities that were just mentioned. And fortunately in 53, there was the constitutional convention that said for the first time you could consolidate city and county governments. And it's not the city taking over the county or the county taking over the city. It's truly a new form of government where you combine all the services that the city was providing, all the services that the county was providing. You get the efficiencies of only having one fire department, one police department, one system of education, you know, one clerk. Um, just you didn't have all the duplication of services that you would have when you had two different forms of government. So the first effort was in 1958. Um, some of the main things I want to hit on that, that uh, I think are important were the size that was proposed in the 1958 charter and in that char of, the, of the governing body. And, and in that 1958 charter, there were to be 20 council districts plus the vice mayor. And in order to be 
approved, for consolidated government to be approved, there had to be a vote in the city limits that passed, and there had to be a vote in the county outside the city limits that also passed. You couldn't just combine them. You had to have two, you had to pass in both the city and in the county. And in the first attempt in 58, it passed pretty substantially in the city, but it failed in the county. And again, despite the fact, as, as both David and Jim mentioned, in 1958, everybody was for consolidation. Both newspapers, I mean, it, it, this was a time when you had the very liberal Tennessean, the morning paper. You had the very conservative afternoon paper, the Nashville Banner. Both papers supported it. Folks, that never happened. It was very rare that both the, the papers would be in favor of something. You also had uh, the, the, the Tennessee Central, or the National Central Labor Council supporting it, as did the Chamber of Commerce. That was pretty rare for both labor organizations and, and the business community community to be in favor of it. And both the county mayor, uh, they call him the, the county judge at that time, the, um, uh, Beverly Briley was in favor of it, as was Ben West, who was the city mayor. But, but it failed, and one, uh, lots of reasons, and I could spend more time than I have talking about why it didn't pass the first time, but one of the major, major reasons was there was going to be a loss of political power, particularly by those people in the, in the county. Um, and, and think about this. We had a proposed consolidation of city and county with 20 council districts and a vice mayor. Well, at the time that, that it was attempted in 58, the city council had 21 members, and you had a vice mayor and also the mayor. The county was governed by the county judge, Beth Briley, and 52 magistrates. And they were had their own district and they were what we would call county commissioners today. So you look at the, the number of people, you know, there were 76 politicians running the city and the county. Uh, but under the 1958 charter, there would only be 22 positions. So one of the big concerns was is that the politicians would lose their power. And so many people, particularly in the county, opposed it for that reason. And for lots of other reasons too. But the first attempt failed. So what happened then uh, after the first attempt? And I'm really glad that we've already talked some about it because to, Mayor West did two things. One, he, he started annexing like crazy. And I didn't know till Jim said it that from 28 to 58, there'd been no annexation. Um, but, but Mayor West annexed 42 square miles with 82,000 citizens. Interestingly, that dropped the African-American population, or the black population in Nashville from over 40% to 25%. He also implemented the green sticker tax, the 10, the 10 for Ben. Um, somebody told me that it'd be worth about $100 in today's money, but it was $10 was a lot. And anyone who's used the city streets more than a very few number of times had to have the green sticker, whether you lived in the city, whether you lived in the newly annexed area of the city, or whether you, you lived in the county. So um, the, the, there was a second attempt, uh, and there had to be a vote. What had to happen is there had to be a, a, a private act of the legislature to allow for a vote again, and the citizens of Nashville and of Davidson County voted to have another charter commission to try to consolidate. And, in the 1962 charter, most of the things that appeared in the 58 charter uh, remained. There were a couple of fights, interestingly enough. One was over whether to elect or appoint the school board. Those in favor of an appointed school board, appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the council, uh, they won that fight. But then in 1981, there was a charter amendment to change it from an appointed school board to an elected school board. I might not be here today if it hadn't been for that because I was fortunate enough in 1982 ran for the school board at age 26 and uh, probably never would have been appointed at age 26 by the mayor. The, the other thing that was happening during this time is uh, Ben West was trying to move employees um, out of 
civil service protection so he would have more say so over their positions just as a way to try to consolidate his political power um, and, and that was again in the in the charter there were more specific provisions um, m many of which frankly my father wrote because he was concerned about the, the what would happen with the employees to ensure civil service and, and and metro now has some very strong civil service provisions that, that protect employees but the single most important change that was made was to increase the size of the council from the 21 that had been or 20 that had been proposed to 35 districts and five council positions at large and that was a that was done not only to address the political concerns of people who were going to lose their base of support but it was also done to ensure minority representation and I'm glad that that um, David mentioned uh, Z Alexander Luby who was on both commissions and who was a uh, just a, a, a force in this town uh, as as a black lawyer at a time when there were not very many black lawyers um, and he served on the commission and as, as, as either David or Jim said, I'll, uh, I'll do it, but I'm not sure I'm going to vote for it. And ultimately, he did vote for it. Uh, one of the other political leaders in the black community at that time was a man named Bob Lillard. And Bob Lillard remained opposed to it. And Luby and Lillard were the first two blacks elected to the Nashville City Council um, since the early 1900s. They were both on the city council at the time. And there's a great uh, story that I just want to tell because it's um, uh, <laughs> one of the charter commission members was a man named Victor Johnson. Victor Johnson had moved his business, Aladdin Industries, from Michigan to Nashville in the, in the I guess, late 40s or early 50s. Everybody knows his son, Tory Johnson, who was DA here for years. And there was great debate in the black community about whether to support consolidated government or not. And the concern was if Luby didn't support it, having been on the, com on the commission, that that would really be a detriment to getting it passed. So uh, Victor Johnson went to um, uh, Luby and, and said this, if we don't have metropolitan government for Nashville, the core city will atrophy and whoever is the first black mayor will have nothing but trouble. It is much better in your lifetime and in my lifetime for this community to grow and prosper economically and the lot of blacks will improve with it. What I'm told is after that conversation, Luby decided to come out in favor of it because one of the things his constituents were telling him was, we have an opportunity to elect a black mayor in Nashville. And so that was one of the reasons that some in the black community didn't want to support consolidation because they, they would see it as diluting their power. But at the end of the day, Mr. Luby saw the advantages to it. Um, an interesting side note is both in his council district, or you know, city council district and in Bob Lillard City Council District, uh, it, it, the consolidation did not pass. It was, it was actually defeated pretty, pretty handily. So um, long story short, there was an election in 1962. Uh, it passed in the city. Consolidation did 21,000 to a little over 15,000. And in the, in the county, it passed 15,900 to 12,400. And interestingly enough, because of the way the council districts were drawn, five African Americans were elected to the council. Z. Alexander Luby was, was, was elected. Um, Bob Lillard was elected. John Driver, a name many of you probably know, Harold Love Sr., uh, whose son is now in the legislature, and Mansfield Douglas, who served many, many years uh, on the council, uh, only had to leave because of uh, term limits. So. Um, that's a little bit of the history. The, um, as the Tennessean reported on June 29th, 1962, 
Metro scores an easy win. So this paper, I'm, I'm going to have to do something with it because it's beginning to get a little bit dog-eared. But I know. So encapsulate it. So yeah, so, I have a question for you, Dewey, sure. before you go into the other part. Um, why didn't they give up after the first time? Because it's just, it would have been easy to say, well, the people don't want it. Why try again? It, you know, everyone was for it and it still didn't pass. I think, I, I, you know, I think it was a time when people were really concerned about the, the, the city of Nashville and wanting to see it prosper and watching it continue to decline. Um, th there, was, there were also still the concerns of we just don't have the services in the, the county, yet it's continuing to grow. Like Jim said, the reason they're larger lots is because people had to have a, a septic tank. Uh, and, and so I think people were realizing if we're going to get city services, um, we're going to have to do something <coughs> to get those services. And also, too, and part of it was Ben West's consolidation. People who lived in those areas that were, consol that were um, annexed were concerned because suddenly they were paying city taxes, but yet there was no plan for services. And one of the things that the charter had, it had to have a plan for services. That's why we have a, uh, an urban services district where you get street lights and uh, trash pickup and other specific city services, but you pay a higher tax. You pay a, the urban services uh, district tax for that as opposed to the the, the general services district where you don't get those. But, but back, back to your point, I, I think it was um, the, the citizens who were interested in doing this, uh, folks like my dad, but there were a lot of other folks, uh, uh, people like Victor Johnson, who really wanted to see this, you know, this area prosper. People like George Cate, who was the head of Citizens for Better Government. Um, his predecessor was Charlie Warfield, who became uh, one of the members of the commission in 1962 after uh, he was appointed after someone had, had passed away. So I, I think that's probably um, the best uh, response that, that I can give you. Okay. Linda, uh, you're going to give us a historical background on these people that were appointed to the Charter Commission and who they were and kind of why do you think they were there? I I'm going to give you a little bit of... Thanks to Dewey and, and you and, and my colleague at the end, you have really given a lot about what I was going to say. But, you know, as I was sitting here thinking, this consolidation took place in the midst of the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement, the modern movement, starts in 1954. We're talking consolidation 1958. In 1957, you have Kelly versus Board of Education mm -hmm. in Nashville. You also have the student sit-in movement taking place in 1960. When the charter is affirmed on April the 1st, 1963, that is one year away from the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So what we have taken place is right in the middle of the civil rights movement. And when I look at the number of people, the 10 people who were put on the Charter Commission, the fact that you have two blacks, Dr. Meadows and Attorney Z. Alexander Luby, and also Rebecca Thomas, that's taking place in a movement that is going for equality and justice. Uh, when, you know, you, you look at the two members uh, that were appointed to replace uh, positions that were vacated by Edward Hicks, for example, who passed away, uh, I think in his place, Charlie Warfield was, was appointed. Uh, and you also had Thomas McGrath, uh, who was appointed by West, but he excused himself from the duty uh, because he was one of the two state senators uh, who had passed the private act naming the commission members. So he had excused himself. Uh, he was replaced by Joe Torrance, who was the mayor's, Mayor West finance director and a close political ally uh, who took 
who was on there. When you look at uh, people like Carmack Cochran, uh, he was a, an, a, an attorney. He was president of the Nashville Transit Company, uh, head of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, and he became chair of the Charter Commission. Uh, you know, when you look at all of them, they were very wise, I think, in the appointments because it, it covers all of society in Nashville. Whether you, you had a person who was appointed that was um, principal of a school. Uh, when you look at people like Harlan Dotson, he was an attorney and a state senator and he led the, the fight for the enabling legislation. Uh, Victor Johnson, who I knew personally, who used to be on the, uh, he served as chair of the Tennessee Historical Commission. We've already talked about, he was, what, he was over the Aladdin he was president of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, he was on the Charter Commission for Nashville and Davidson County from 1957, 58, and 61-62. He was active in that campaign. That resulted in the uh, adoption of the Metropolitan Form of Government. Dr. George Meadows, an African-American, uh, he was a pharmacist. Uh, he was trained at Meharry Medical College. He was the founder of People's Pharmacy that was located on Jefferson Street. And he was also a very prominent uh, leader in the African-American business community. And he was active in several other organizations and was very committed to civic engagement. Uh, if we look at Cecil Branstetter, uh, and we all know what a tireless representative he was for working people. Uh, organized labor and his efforts to halt uh, the attempt of the closing of Highlander Folk School, for example. Um, he trained uh, civil rights activists, or he worked with them. Uh, he also went to bat when the state of Tennessee was going to close Highlander uh, Folk School. He, served on both the 57th, uh, which was an unsuccessful charter commission, and the 62 charter commission that led to the successful formation of Davidson County's combined metropolitan form of government. Uh, he was a major factor in writing and the preserving of the charter. He also chaired the uh, Metro Charter Revision Committee in 1976, and he continued to serve on the Metro Charter Revision Commission thereafter. Uh, I mentioned a person who was the principal of Warner Elementary School in East Nashville. That was Robert Chenault. Uh, we've mentioned Z. Alexander Luby. We talk about him uh, in terms of being the attorney in Nashville, but Z. Alexander Luby went across the state of Tennessee defending the civil rights of African Americans. You can, you can look in Knoxville, you can look in Columbia, you can look in Memphis. Uh, one of the statements, he practiced law in Memphis for a while, and he made the statement that the reason he left Memphis was because he was not going to be treated less than a man. Mm. And I'm paraphrasing, but that was the essence of what he was saying. Uh, you know, he... He is primarily responsible for Thurgood Marshall's life being saved uh, in Columbia, Tennessee, when the state troopers attempted uh, to pull them over when Thurgood Marshall was helping Luby uh, defend the 25 defendants in the first race riot that took place after World War II in Columbia, Tennessee. They stopped the car and told Marshall to get out. Luby said, no, you don't. You stay right in this car. If Marshall had gotten out, we may not have had him as the first African-American to serve as Supreme Court justice. Luby was responsible for saving his life. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because uh, Cecil, you mentioned, you know, the, the back and forth between Luby and, and Lillard. Uh, but people also need to be aware that Luby also 
uh, contacted the economics professor at Fisk University, who was the one that was responsible for uh, the withdrawal of economic support in the African American community when the students were sitting in downtown. Uh, so there was a lot of back and forth. People in, Loop, in Lilith's district did not support the consolidation. Uh, just on a personal note, I remember my family having conversations about whether or not they supported or did not support. Uh, my father was in business and he was leaning toward, as was my uncle's, leaning toward supporting it because they could see some benefit from it. I had other members in the family, uh, not the uh, nuclear family, but the extended family that were against it. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was division within the African American community, mm -hmm. even within families about how you're going to support. Uh, consolidation. Linda, can I ask you a question about something that Dewey said about, you know, if the way it was going, we would have 40% black mm -hmm. in the city, we would have had an African-American mayor. As you know, we've never had an African-American mayor. So, you know, my friend Francis Guest, and you, everyone knows Francis. Yeah, my is, friend too. Is, uh, would always say to me, he would have been the first black mayor of Nashville. And so we have this wonderful metropolitan government that everyone agrees on is mm -hmm. great, but did it really come at the political cost of African-American political power? Personally and from my own research, I would say yes. I, I, I do think that it came at a cost of political power, uh, which is part of the reason that the what I call the Lillard faction was really kind of against consolidation. Uh, like I said, Luby came to the point of, you know, backing consolidation. But, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if I even see an African American <laughs> in the near future mm -hmm. as, as being, a, being mayor. Never know. Our current mayor wasn't necessarily on the radar screen a few years ago. Either. Well, I... But the current mayor is not African American, and uh, you know, uh, and, and I like the current mayor. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I'm just saying, I think there are a lot of of factors um, involved. So, other question: the, You mentioned that the civil rights movement was going on, the you know, integration of schools in 1950. Or desegregation of schools, yeah. as I call it. Desegregation, the Nashville Plan, as you know, 1957. Right. And then, of course, the lunch counter sit-ins in 1960, all kind of in the backdrop. What influence did all this happening have potentially on the charter passing, or maybe even mm -hmm. how it was thought about? as people were fleeing to you the know, suburbs. You I, know, I would almost have to see the breakdown in the vote, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the African-American vote in, in particular, uh, to answer that question. Uh, but if, if I just give you somewhat of an educated guess, uh, I think that Again, I think it depends on the demographics and, and how you're looking at that vote. Uh, for most people, you know, I remember that little green sticker <laughs> very well. Uh, I wasn't old enough to drive, but I remember my father complaining about having to pay the $10 to drive your car. Uh, I, I'm not sure how I really, really think about it. Uh, you know, I think it depends on the socioeconomic class. Mm -hmm. uh, and speaking specifically in terms of the African American community, uh, those that could see a benefit, um, you know, perhaps some of the people in Lubis District, which was basically a higher socioeconomic district when you look at Tennessee State, Fisk, Meharry. Uh, and those people, uh, some of the people in various areas in his district, 
I think were, were more supportive as opposed to some of the people in Lillard's district um, who were <clears throat> not as you, much in support. You studied Luby a lot. Um, his house, of course, was bombed on April 19, 1960 right when all this was going on. Right. Why do you think he was still able to feel so positive about the city where he, he could have almost been killed in his home and participate in well, this? Well, you know, I think you have to go back and look at, at Luby's background. Mm -hmm. First of all, Luby was born in Antigua. So when we use that term African-American or West Indian, he was not what I will call right. a native African-American uh, and to me from from you know if I look at a lot of leaders like Shirley Chisholm and her background uh, if I look at people like Charles S. Johnson or his son Jeb Johnson who served in the Obama administration when you go back and look at their backgrounds and where they are from they are not native to America necessarily or their ancestry is not native to America. They, they, they have a West Indian background or also an African background. And I think that's, that is a little bit different. While Luby may have moved here, lived here, mm. underwent segregation here, there's a different mindset, I think, uh, from the people, from the leaders that I have looked at. It is, there's a different mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, even though they may have been under enslaved, most of those people were enslaved by people who were not actually on the land. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think it's, it, you yeah. really have to study the, the different people. Oh, thank you, thank you. We're going to get back to Jim, and uh, this is a 1941 code of the city of Nashville, and you're going to talk to us about the difference between the code and the charter, and I know in your days with Metro Legal, you probably know the code better than anyone else today, and I know in your private practice today, you work with people navigating that, so tell us the difference between these two documents and how it evolved. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, David, I'm forgetting more now than I, than I remember, but um, yeah, so I think it's, it is important to understand the difference between the Charter and the Code because um, they serve different purposes, and, um, and part of, part of uh, that is, is premised upon kind of the basics of the law of municipalities in Tennessee and the power that municipalities have in Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee follows uh, what's basically called the Dillon Rule across the country. It's named after a judge over in, I think it was Iowa, uh, Judge Dillon. And he came up with, a, he in a case, was articulating a rule on the powers of local governments or cities and, and basically said cities may only exercise the powers that are expressly granted to them or implied from an express grant of power from the legislature or their charter. And so we talked a little bit about this earlier that, you know, cities could be created or dissolved before 1953. But also the, the Dillon rule on powers of cities is still the same. It's still followed in Tennessee. You've got to have a in order for a city or a county to exercise a power, it's got to come. That power has to be granted to them by the legislature, and the Home Rule Amendment changed that a little bit by allowing Home Rule municipalities and also consolidated governments, which are really not true Home Rule municipalities from the standpoint they've not adopted a Home Rule referendum, but the Metropolitan Government Enabling Act, which was adopted by the legislature following the constitutional amendment specifically provided that consolidated governments could amend their charters by referendum. And so as a result, consolidated governments are a form of a home rule municipality. They're just not 
they're not created the same way as a home rule municipality from the standpoint you don't have a referendum to adopt the home rule you have a referendum to adopt the charter so the difference is the charter is like the tennessee constitution or the federal constitution it's the constitution of the city it's the it's the organic law that creates the various offices departments and sets forth what parameters they operate in it provides for how the legislative body uh, acts. I mean, we have this process of ordinances, which require three readings and a majority vote of the members of the council on third reading. That comes from the charter. And, and legislative acts have to be adopted by, the, by an ordinance. And the law in Tennessee is very clear that if a, a municipality or a county or consolidated government doesn't follow their charter in adopting their their legislative acts and those acts are void so th they have the charter has great significance from the standpoint it creates sets out the powers sets out the offices that have to be uh, uh, provided for in the in the consolidated government sets forth what their powers were one of the issues that happened when the uh, metropolitan government was consolidated were several of the constitutional officers that were created by the that have to be created by the Constitution. Some of their powers were altered by the consolidated uh, government charter, and they sued, saying, "Well, you can't do that." And the Tennessee Supreme Court said, "Well, you need to read this concept, this amendment, this consolidation provision that says that in a consolidation you can alter the powers. You can't abolish them." But you can change their powers. So, for example, like the sheriff, particularly. I guess. Yeah. So the sheriff had law enforcement power across um, the uh, county prior to the consolidation, and as a result of the consolidation, the sheriff now is the custodian of the jail, and the police department has countywide law enforcement power. They changed their powers, uh, and the sheriff sued challenging that and lost uh, the assessor sued uh, the, uh, not the assessor the county clerk sued and lost so there were several lawsuits that came after consolidation that challenged those provisions but but in the end the courts held no when you consolidate you can alter the powers you can't abolish them but you can alter their powers so jim tell me about this charter commission that you and dewey have served on what do you all really do <laughs> so <laughs> What we going to be really interested to hear what Jim says about that. <laughs> we do whatever Dewey tells us to do, since he's, since he's the son of the charter. But no, what we do, our role, and, and again, the charter provides for a charter revision commission, and then, then the code, let me, let me stop and talk just a, briefly about this document, which is now, this is the old city code. Now we have a metro code. The metro code is really a codification of all the ordinances that the, that the uh, metro council has adopted. And it can be amended by other ordinances. So the council can amend an ordinance just by adopting another ordinance. The charter, on the other hand, to be amended, you have to have a referendum. And so that was one of the things, and that's required um, by the State Enabling Act. It says you've got to have a referendum in the Charter. What the Charter Revision Commission does is when proposed amendments come from the Council, and, well, now we have two, two roles. <laughs> After the uh, 22 amendment, we have two roles. Our first oldest role is when the Council proposed amendments to the Charter the amendments would be sent to the Charter Rec uh, Review Commission for a recommendation. And so we would traditionally have uh, the proponent of the amendment from the council come and any supporters or opposition come and talk to us about why this is a good or bad amendment. And then we would make a recommendation. It's not by, I mean, it's just a recommendation. And then the council would adopt the amendment as a resolution and put it on the ballot. In the 22 amendment, now for petition-initiated <coughs> amendments, which are uh, uh, where a, a group goes out and gets a petition and says, we, we, we want to amend the charter, before they can collect signatures, they have to come in and have their form of their petition approved by the Charter Revision Commission. And we now have criteria for what we have to consider any time a petition comes before us to make sure that it meets 
uh, specific requirements on complying with state law, you know, having the right f terminology, and it has to contain a fiscal impact statement and some things like that. So, Jim, tell us the difference, because I think most people understand what the Metro Council does. They pass laws. But why would certain things go to the Metro Council for passage, but some are reserved to amend the charter? Give us some examples of what you would need to do to amend the charter versus the council could act and do something. So, uh, and these are just hypotheticals, but let's say that you wanted to abolish uh, a particular department of the government that's provided for in the charter. You'd have to go and amend the charter to do that. Dewey mentioned one earlier. One of the more significant amendments to the charter was the 81 amendment that t changed the school board from being appointed by the mayor to being elected by the public. And so up until 81, 82, I guess, was the first uh, elected board. But up until that time, the mayor appointed all the school board members. From that point forward, they've been elected. So again, you change the structure of how those things uh, are done. So before we go to our vice mayor, I want to ask Dewey, do you have anything to add about this whole, your role and kind of what you think that why this is such an important uh, position being on the charter revision. Uh, I think Jim summarized it pretty well, but one of the things to kind of emphasize is that part of our role is also to conduct a public hearing uh, and allow anyone who wishes to uh, uh, proponent or opponent of a, a charter revision uh, or charter, proposed charter uh, amendment that comes from the, the Metro Council. So the, the way it would work, as Jim said, is you know, that uh, Sherry, who's chairman of the Charter Revision Committee, if someone proposes a charter rev revision or amendment, it would go to her committee in the council. Then it would be referred to the Charter Revision Commission, which is what Jim and I serve on. And, and we would vet it and have a public hearing, and then we would vote, the seven members would vote to determine whether we recommend approval or disapproval. And so it's, it's just sort of a, it's, it's a, another layer of um, uh, opportunity for people to, to opine on the validity or, or the, the detriment that a particular proposed amendment may have. And as Jim points out, our role was significantly expanded in uh, 22 on how citizen petition drives that to, attempts to amend the charter. Um, there had been some attempts to amend the charter by petition drive that frankly were contrary to the state law. So they could never have passed. And, and as a result, before they went on the ballot, there was extensive litigation. And so to avoid that from happening again, the thought was before you go out and secure now what would have to be about 50,000 signatures is about what it would take in, in this day and age to, to do a citizen-driven petition, that it comes to the commission and we opine basically on whether it's illegal or not. Yes, um, thank, thank you, Dewey. So before we get to our Vice Mayor um, Henderson, I have a quote that I want to re read to you from Rebecca Thomas, the lawyer and member of the original uh, Charter Commission. Speaking of the Charter, she said, it is not perfect but it's far from a hodgepodge of that arrangements in our community, which is now struggling. And this is what she says about amending it. Mm -hmm. The issue is not whether the charter is perfect because it has its flaws. It can be amended. So, Vice Mayor mm -hmm. Henderson, welcome and tell us about the process that you have kind of led and putting everyone together and uh, what all you. this means. Yeah, well, um, so I, I really appreciate all the anecdotes and, and sharing about uh, Vice Mayor Kate. Um, he was a constituent of mine, and um, I really wish I had had more time um, to speak with him and get to know him better. One of the last uh, acts of mine on council as a council member um, was a resolution uh, honoring him as uh, the the first uh, vice mayor, and he he passed um, during the the pandemic. Um, and so um, I, I appreciate his his work being uh, elevated. So as um, Ms. Uh, Chair Weiner. Uh, uh, shared uh, at, at the top of this, um, I uh, chaired the Charter Revision Committee 
of the council um, in 2022, um, when we knew just as far as kind of the, the cycle of elections and so forth, um, uh, that uh, we were gonna have uh, some things before us to consider. And um, chief among them, I think, uh, was uh, how to amend the charter by petition, as, as you discussed, but a whole host of uh, proposals from a housekeeping perspective. And so if you look at um, uh, the clerk at the time, Elizabeth Waits, um, had prepared a, uh, just a uh, listing basically of every single effort um, to previously amend the charter um, that was successful, basically just a chronology. And when you look at that chronology, as Ms. Wiener said, it's it's online um, under council resources in the uh, charter revision uh, SharePoint there, uh, but uh, just, uh, so much housekeeping. <laughs> and to, to Ms. Thompson's point, it, it is not perfect. Um, and so you do have very um, significant changes such as the 1981 you know, school board by-election and a, a whole host of those as well. But um, in, uh, in the majority from a volume perspective, it, it is a lot of, uh, of housekeeping. And so um, we, in that year, um, for the first time, I really tried because as a council member, I was a little, it seemed a little opaque to me somewhat about like, well, how did these kind of get before us? Um, how did the council consider them? Were they advanced by the administration? For what reason? Were it of personal interest to the mayor or particular department, a certain council member? Um, and so I really wanted to take that opportunity from an education perspective for the body and the public. Um, you know, what have we done before? What's been put before us? What has been proposed? and kind of um, aggregate that for everybody's uh kind of awareness, and um, then to facilitate a process wherein um, council members uh, could uh, submit their uh, suggestions for consideration of uh, the committee in a way that was a little less formal because there before it had just been, oh, we're gonna file this uh, piece of legislation and kind of try to put this uh, forward. So um, I think that was, uh, interesting to see. It was a whole lot of, again, housekeeping um, and various uh, proposals about uh, how we approach uh, the work that we do. Um, but it, I think, afforded an opportunity to have sort of a record of um, what's being considered, um, what's been thought about, um, kind of what you know, is, is the juice worth the squeeze, so to speak? Um, because um, there are only so many uh, things that you can sort of bring to the public's attention and educate about um, and kind of contextualize to get on the ballot. Um, and of course, you know, the full language of the change has to be on the ballot and is in the council's legislation. And so if you are a voter and there are a lot of things on the ballot, you're wanting to make sure that that's really, um, from the committee's perspective, really cogent and explanatory. The Charter Revision Commission is in looking at that language as well. And so, um, you know, we, uh, the administration wanted to effectuate uh, the DOT, the Department of Transportation, um, and then uh, we had something about health board composition, and then um, the standards for MNPD service being aligned um, with uh, military service um, uh, heretofore. So again, I think, uh, you know, uh, maybe two more minor housekeeping DOT, fairly significant, and then how to amend the charter by petition, but that was kind of came through a funnel of a whole bunch of proposals from uh, council members and just as a committee kind of having to balance, um, uh, you know, what is the uh, kind of civic bandwidth of the public um, to uh, amend the charter. And there has to be a fair amount of educating around that by council, by the administration. Why are we doing this? Why is it needed? Why is it worth your time to understand and, and vote on this? So um, it's, uh, you know, it can really, run uh, the gamut, but um, I will share if I may, um, uh, David, just one anecdote. When I considered running for office, I thought, um, you know, back in 2014, um, uh, before starting to serve on the council in 2015, I was like, well, I should probably read the city constitution, right? I should probably <laughs> read the charter um, to understand that. And what I was really struck by as a woman running for office, 
council man, council man, the mayor, he, he, he there, he. there was nary a female pronoun in that entire document. The mayor, he, um, uh, you know, the, the, and so, um, uh, Councilman Rosenberg and I, um, uh, advanced, uh, a, a charter amendment through council, um, that made that gender neutral. Um, and so, uh, you know, people may consider that housekeeping, but I think that's pretty significant, right? Like I don't think it's appropriate that the constitution of a city um, only contemplates um, that, you know, men would be in service. So um, sometimes that housekeeping matters. And um, I did, I found that chairmanship really um, interesting. Um, and, um, and I thought council did uh, some good work that year. Vice Mayor Henderson, you were popularly elected along with the other members of the council and the mayor. Uh, some cities, the vice mayor, I guess, is elected within the body which you serve. Uh, do you think that this is a, you like that method here? And when you talk to your kind of colleagues across the country and they ask about Nashville, even the size of the council and kind of how you govern, what do you say about them and what do they think about the way our government is structured? I appreciate that. They do ask a lot about it. Um, and I speak with a great deal of pride, as I think all Nashvillians should, about being the first fully city county consolidated government in the United States of America. And when they ask, you know, why is this the third largest municipal council after New York and Chicago? Um, it really was the effectuation of a compromise that was quite prescient um, for uh, the nation and looking at how cities were developing and sprawling. Um, we did not lose um, that, uh, that, that revenue to um, the suburbs um, and, and see that kind of inner, inner city uh, decline. Um, I think from a, a functional perspective, um, the size of the body does present some challenges, um, but it likewise presents many strengths. Um, and so uh, I often say that the size of the council um, at this juncture truly reflects the diversity of the city. Um, we are, uh, last term, uh, we had equity as far as women in service. It was half of the council. Um, now we have a slight uh, majority. Um, our uh, racial representation, our representation around, uh, you know, professional skill sets, experience, uh, you know, district council members can understand their district at a really granular level. Um, we are highly accessible to our uh, constituents. Um, uh, they can reach out to us and, and, and get a response. And we are 526 square miles. And that does present a lot of challenges um, for Nashville, just from a programmatic implementation of things, like just the scale issues um, are pretty uh, challenging for us. So I think given that scale, um, there is some benefit to the size of the body. And um, I think uh, uh, Ms. Wynn was speaking to, you know, the at-large seats, um, but, you know, the at present now, as we look at kind of the, the evolution of Nashville, the first and second chair are held by black women. And so um, Ms. Suar won outright, um, uh, Ms. Porterfield in the, in the second uh, round there. Um, so very significant vote getters um, uh, uh, for uh, their time of election. So. One of the things that city char uh, Metro Charter clean cleaned up was a succession plan. When Hillary House was thrown out of the mayor's office in 1915, a court appointed Robert Ewing, the mayor of Nashville at the time. And then when Hillary House came back and died in office in 1938, mm -hmm. the city council temporarily appointed a successor until the next election. And as you know, we have now a secession of the mayor's office. So is that, talk about that and the other things that the new charter kind of works a little bit better. Yeah, and I think um, it, one of your first questions that I did not circle all around uh, uh, back to, but was about uh, comparatively um, in Nashville, the vice mayor being elected countywide. So I am the vice mayor of Nashville and 
president of the city council. And to your point, in many uh, other councils, the, the president of the body is elected internal to the body. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I do think that's, um, from my perspective, good for checks and balances. Um, you know, the strong executive relative to the legislative um, and that, uh, you know, when the vice mayor is elected uh, countywide. And then I think that also then goes to succession, right? It's not just internal to the body, somebody that was appointed um, from those however many 40 people, um, but that, um, you know, God forbid, if in that were to happen, um, the person in the vice mayor seat has likewise been elected countywide. Do you have anything else to add today? I don't think so. I appreciate okay. the invitation. Thank Wonderful. You. And thank you for being here and your leadership with the city. So um, our last panelist is Brenda Haywood, and she's going to tell us a personal story. And her office used to be just right upstairs above us when she was deputy mayor. So. <coughs> Talk to us about your growing up here in Nashville and your experience with government. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here today. And uh, as I reflect upon my personal story, I think about uh, Ecclesiastes. And in chapter 3, it talks about there's a time and a season for everything under the sun. And as I think about my, oh, my God, the date of my birth, I was born May 7th of 1951. And when I think about that time and that season to try to encapsulate everything, um, I don't know if I was born at the right time or the wrong time. <laughs> and I say that because there's such a dichotomy and the antithesis is of the fact that um, as Miss Wynn articulated, I was born 1951, and I can remember in the early 60s, and I can remember the sit-ins, and um, I was a member of um, Moses McKissick School from first through fourth grade, and then my parents moved us, myself, the middle child, and I had a brother that's four years younger, and then I have a sister that's, no, my brother's four years older, and my sister's four years younger, and we moved to Inglewood, and I became a student at Inglewood Elementary School. And I, as I reflect on uh, Brown versus the Board of Education, and this, the determination of segregation not being legal was in 1954. And of course, I was three years old then. And as a fifth grader, I attended elementary school at Inglewood. And I was born just at the time that the step plan was put in force, and that was in 1957. When I was in the fifth grade, they integrated to the fifth grade. In sixth grade, they integrated to sixth grade, and so on and so forth. And I wanted to go downtown, and I wanted to be a part of the march. And my mother was, was like, are you kidding me? You're only eight, you're only nine, but somewhere just my little intestinal fortitude say go and march because it's not, a, it's not fair what we're being subjected to. In my home, I felt like I was born in a bubble. My parents didn't talk much about uh, segregation and injustice. They didn't even want us to really be aware of it, which I think uh, that was a detriment. But I would always read and I wanted to go downtown and. Mom said no, and my brother, which was four years older, he didn't want to have anything to do with it. I'm going to Pearl High School, I'm going to all the black schools. If I have to get on the bus at four o'clock in the morning, so be it. With me, no, we have a right to go to school two blocks over. And so um, when I was in the sixth grade at Inglewood, I never will forget, my best friend was a little blonde-headed girl. I tell you, Elizabeth kind of looked like her. and. Uh, she came to school one day in April, and we were sixth graders, and she was crying, and she said, my daddy said that people that look like you couldn't go to Stratford. Stratford had been in existence three years at the time. And I says, why? Because my dad said, I can go anywhere I want to go, because that's the way we were being raised. And at that point, it was a little late, because I, I came from a home where there was a lot of love. Uh, we believed in the Lord, and uh, we felt good about who we were. But the society out there painted an entirely different picture of who we were. And I could not embrace that. I had a very hard time. And you alluded to the fact of mindsets. 
where in our race, a lot of the mindsets were in the four walls of our homes, okay? Because four young ladies, I convinced them to go to Stratford with me. And a lot of our, but I was of a whole different mindset. I thought I was, my daddy taught me, you're not less than anybody and you're not better than anybody. And I believed that, and that was reflected at the library. And I believed that, and when they would call me the N-word, and when they tried to dismantle what I had been taught, and when they wanted me to be dismayed, I made it unequivocally clear to them, that's not what I've been taught, and that's not what's within my soul. I have every right to be here. And I tell people, they say, well, why would you go at the age of 12 to Stratford? I said, I think I went because they told me I couldn't. And I think that's why I went. But to make a long story short, I wanted to go downtown and I wanted to protest. I wanted to march with John Lewis and Martin Luther King. And I was probably 13, 14 years younger. And to fast forward, even today, I became a teacher. I went to Tennessee State. Mom said, you have all these scholarships. Why do you want to go to Tennessee State? I said, I want to go anywhere where the majority of the people look like me. And I wanted to go somewhere where people knew to be black and to be proud. And I went to Tennessee State. Then I received uh, a scholarship, P uh, Vanderbilt. They teamed up with Peabody to train teachers in a new, innovative type way. They were looking for 30 of the best and the brightest across the country. And I applied, and I became one of the 30. So now I'm at Vanderbilt Peabody working on my master's. And after two years, I obtained a master's. And uh, never will forget, we had sensitivity sessions. It were three blacks out of 30. And they asked us about our socioeconomic backgrounds. And I said, all I know is I'm rich. And uh, was far from it when you look at what rich really meant. But I came from a home of a lot of love. I never wanted for anything. If my dad had to work three jobs, four jobs, five jobs, whatever, we were going to have, okay? So um, I go on and I become an educator and I get my first job. Mr. Webb, that was my principal at Stratford, gave me my first job at McMurray. And uh, I walked up and he said, I haven't seen you in a few years. And uh, he said, I know you're well qualified. He said, because I walked beside you at Stratford when you uh, uh, matriculated through that particular uh, school. And never will forget when my dad dropped me off, I told him to go on because we were met with a lot of unrest on that day in, 19, in September 1963. And I said, the more you lash out against me, the more determined I am to go in to do well. They told us we were ignorant. We would never amount to anything. And all I can say is I can show you better than I can tell you. So I went on, graduated Peabody Vanderbilt and uh, became a teacher. And at that time, I'm 20 something years old, and I was faced with the students there at that time, they faced the same prejudice and the same injustice that I faced as a little girl, not quite as bad. Malcolm X said, uh, racism is kind of like a Cadillac. Every year they come out with a new model. What do you say? Every year they come out with a new model. And that's what I thought about racism. Every year there's, it's the same racism, it's just a new model. So um, I was that teacher that fought um, just unwavering my fight was for the students, for all students. And uh, so today, I'm just here to serve notice that nobody's in charge of your destiny. And as I look at what's going on at Tennessee State University, and as I study the voucher plan, I don't know how much, uh, I had a voter registration drive at Stratford just prior to coming here today. And, uh, the jury is still out. We have a lot of lawyers in the room there and Ms. Toombs and different people. But the jury is still out as to whether um, you know, it's kind of piercing for me as mm -hmm. to whether we gained or whether we lost mm -hmm. when it came to segregation and integration. And, and, and I'm not real sure. I think it's a little bit on either side. So uh, it's, yeah. it's kind of piercing for me. But um, uh, all I, I can say is Jesse Jackson said, I keep hope alive. Can I ask you about a full circle moment in your life mm -hmm. 
Um, you mentioned um, that you graduated from Stratford and you kind of buried the lead. So um, what was your, um, talk, talk about why it was significant for you to graduate from Stratford? Because they told me I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And was there anybody there when you were there? Of African-American descent? Yeah. Um, in 1963, when we integrated Stratford, I just happened to be the first one because school started at seven. <laughs> But I told my dad to take me at five because I knew I had read what I would be faced with, a lot of unrest and, you know, and I was. And so I, I, to this day, as protective as my dad was, I'm not even sure why he left me there. But I made him, I said, Daddy, please go. Because had my daddy witnessed what I had to endure on that day, he would have said, oh, no. I'm not going to leave you here. And every day I would have to misrepresent the truth by telling my dad, all is well, all is well. Well, it was only well because they told me not to stay, and I did, the students there. And um, What did so, you witness that was so bad firsthand? I just witnessed the fact that everything that um, could happen to an African-American in 1963 that was a result of the racism that was the kids there had been indoctrinated by their parents and the teachers there overlooked us. I, um, I competed in my math class to be the top math student. I always wanted to major. Well, I did major in math at Stratford, but I mean, we were just called out of our names. We were just just dismayed and diluted and uh, insulted and rocked home every day and all the things that happened during that time. You helped Mayor John Cooper get elected and uh, he made you deputy mayor. Um, where was he sworn in? And tell us about that day. Oh yeah, and you put out a post. <laughs> you put out that was Brenda Haywood at the age of 12 that walked into Stratford and integrated Stratford. Now she walks into Stratford as the deputy mayor with John Cooper. And that's where he took the oath of office as mayor. And that's where he took the oath of office. And we talked about today. He was with me today for voter registration. John Cooper was with me today. I consider him one of my heroes. And uh, I always like to tell the story, and he drops his head. Um, when we went in that day as, as 12 year olds, and that was in 1963, in 2018, I get a phone call. And um, Kia Hunt's brother, Sean Hunt, he called me and he said, do you remember me? And I said, no. And he said, uh, I've gal galvanized all the kids that walked in that day and were in the seventh grade class with you. And we just want to have, um, we just want to repent. We want to apologize for what we did on that day. And uh, I said, wow. So. They had this big program for us in September, September 29th of 2018. And uh, the other four little girls that came at seven, and I got there at five, they told Sean that uh, my favorite person that I would have to speak at that program that day to be the keynote was John Lewis. I always perfectly admired him and all that he stood for. And, uh, and Gandhi, Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. And I wanted to be that change. I just wanted to be known as a change agent, a, a person that embraced change. So um, Sean contacted John Lewis, and he was going to be our speaker that day. Come find out two days later, he, 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 he said, sure, I'll do that. I'll come to Nashville. Two days later, he found out he had cancer, so he couldn't come. So Sean went to the other two young ladies, and for some reason, who would Brenda want to pick? And uh, they said, well, ask her. Now we're at lunch, and Sean says, uh, who would you like to be the keynote? Since, um, and I'm on the council now. I'm on the council. And uh, I said, well, wait a minute. I pray over everything, y'all. I'm really guided by the Holy Spirit. I dropped my head. I went, OK, Lord, who do you want me to choose to speak on that day? Lord said, John Cooper. Then I said, no, Lord, you don't understand. I need somebody that looks like me, that's probably a little older. Not only is he not older, he doesn't look like me. And he said, well, I told you, John Cooper. 
As I told Sean, I said, well, ask John Cooper. We're on the council together. We're really not that close. I listen to him and, you know, I just kind of matriculate through what he's doing and all. And he asked him and he agreed. And Sean came back and said, oh, he was elated. He was delighted. I said, he's really going to do it? He says, yeah. I said, wow, I wouldn't think he would even have time for that. And, and he did. And, uh, and then after he came to that program and he prepared himself well, as he does, and he spoke, and then he decided that Stratford Nowhere else but Stratford. Take the oath of office. To take the oath yep. of office. And they said, no, you need to do it here. No, I'm doing it at Stratford. So that's why we took that. Well, office. thanks for sharing that with me. And as we wrap this up, um, I have one last story to share. Uh, the Charter Commission members were brilliant, including Dewey's yes. father, Cecil. And so they, oh, we owe the city and the county and this metro government owes them a debt of gratitude that will outlive us all. Uh, but the one thing they did which was not great, <laughs> or they forgot oh. about, I'll conclude with, and it's minor, I guess. So in the old days of the county and the city, the county and the city did things differently. So if you're driving down West End Avenue, all of a sudden it turns uh -oh. into Harding. Oh. You're driving down 21st, all of a sudden it comes into Hillsboro. <laughs> The reason why our streets' na names change is because there were county names and city names. And when we merged the city, here's Wedgwood and Blakemore, uh, Franklin Road and 8th Avenue, they forgot to change the names to one unified. So, but... They left that well, to the council, well, David. Yes. <laughs> well, well done. And thank you, Jim, Brenda, Linda, Dewey, right. Angie. And we're going to throw it back to Sherry Weiner. And of course, we thank Courtney Johnson for being here too as well earlier. Thank you so much. This has been enlightening. And Dewey, I have to share my story. Dewey's father, Cecil, was a patient of mine. I used to have to schedule an extra hour <laughs> every time he came in the office because he had a story about the charter to tell me. <laughs> so although I've heard a lot of these stories, putting it together. Just, just an hour? It, <laughs> just an hour <laughs> as I was walking him out the door. <laughs> um, but being able to put it all together in a cohesive way, I think will be extraordinarily helpful for our current council members, for the students at Hume Fogg with whom I'm sharing this link, as well as with Metro Schools, for any of the classes that want to use this as an opportunity to dig in to their history, to their heritage. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your insight. And we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.